Let's open the Word of God this morning to Romans chapter 16, the wonderful epistle to the Romans of Italy. Romans chapter 16. Given our subject and theme at this time, and that is God sending his gospel and his salvation to the Gentiles, just think about what the title of this epistle means. The Romans. Who were the Romans to the Jews? The Romans were a foreign, oppressing, occupying army of pagans that had taken over their God-given rights, God-given nation, God-given constitution, and had subjected them. Pilate had slain some of them along with their own sacrifices, Jesus dealt with in Luke chapter 13. And so just to see the word Romans, those pagan Italians with their Roman pantheon of gods had come into Israel and taken their nation, but here is a Jew wanting to visit Rome to preach the gospel to them. It says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ. Some of you Romans are also saved, and we want to come and see you. And Paul says in verses 8 through 11 or so that he wanted to make a a trip and a journey that he might come and see the Roman church. And so there's a Jew with an occupying Roman army in his home country, but he wants to go to Italy and preach to the Romans. That is the change that took place. That is hard to comprehend and fathom. If you're thinking with me this morning to want to go preach the gospel to your enemies, but here's the commission and here's the charge that brought the gospel to us. If Paul could preach to Romans We shouldn't be surprised that we have heard the joyful sound ourselves of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 16 at verse 24. This is his ordinary salutation in every one of his epistles. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That is how Paul's epistles close. But he had a P.S. on this one. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. What wonderful verses. Now to him, we want to give glory to God today in verse 25 that has the power. All the power is with God. We have none ourselves and he's got power to establish us and secure us according to Paul's gospel. We can live it. We can obey Paul's gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. For 4,000 years, God had only dealt with the patriarchs and with Israel, but now he was opening it up worldwide. It had been a mystery, but was now being preached to the Gentiles, according to the prophets, But though it had been kept secret since the world began, there in verse 25. But it's now made manifest. It's clearly and obviously for us Gentiles as well. And by the scriptures of the prophets, which foretold this, as early as Genesis chapter 12, Mm -hmm. we are told that we would hear the gospel. Genesis 12. Because God said to Abraham, In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And the reason our families are blessed, and the families of the Americans, and the families of the Gentiles, is because of Genesis 12, 3. And that blessing... It's not because we sell F-15s to Israel in the Middle East. That blessing is explained perfectly in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 that the gospel of justification by faith is preached throughout the world to us. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God. 
Our God is the everlasting God, and he makes commandments. And one of his commandments is for the gospel to be preached even to us, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Faith obeys. And this is the power of God that changed Gentile lives, changed our lives, to obey the gospel to this God, this everlasting God that has all the power, the only wise God, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. And amen. Let us pray. Glorious God and Lord Jehovah, creator of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Loving Father, we come before Thee in the name of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee that according to Thy predestinating purpose and according to the commandment of the everlasting God, You sent the Lord Jesus Christ that we might receive the adoption of sons. O Lord, we were rebels against Thee, but we thank Thee for sending Jesus Christ and having made us accepted in the beloved. We thank thee, Lord of glory. We do not deserve these blessings, but we praise thee, O Lord, for doing so toward us. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the power by which Jesus Christ, who said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, go ye therefore, We thank Thee, Lord of glory, that You sent the greatest preachers into the world with the greatest and most mightiest miracles that we Gentiles might believe the gospel. We thank Thee for the Apostle Paul. We thank Thee that You took Saul of Tarsus and separated him from his mother's womb to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And You prepared him, protected him, provided for him, and prospered him to preach throughout the Roman Empire. We thank Thee for this. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we have heard the joyful sound. If You had not called us out by Your grace, and if You had not sent beautiful feet to preach the gospel of peace to us, we'd be lighting incense sticks this morning to Buddha. We'd be entering some Hindu shrine or bathing in the filthy Ganges. We'd be making a trip to Mecca to look at a meteorite and think that we have done something special. We thank Thee, Lord of glory, for sending Your gospel to us. And this day we have assembled in Thy house to worship Thee and to thank Thee for the gift of Thy Son and to embrace Him in our hearts and with our singing, our praying, and our fellowship together. We thank Thee that we are the blood-bought sons of God. O Lord, we bless and praise your holy name. We would be hopeless without thee. Our condition this morning, if it had not been for your grace and for your gospel, would be unbelievably hopeless. We would be miserable. We would be lost without God and without hope in the world. But we thank thee. Now, Heavenly Father, bless all your servants in every place that call upon thee in sincerity and in truth, bless them by your Holy Spirit to open the word of God and to declare the truth of the gospel to the Gentiles before them. And, O Lord, may there be a great crescendo of praise coming up from the earth today that would make its way into heaven by the sanctifying grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the groanings which cannot be uttered of the Holy Ghost. We pray, Lord, that your gospel will go forth and have free course and be glorified in the earth. Forgive us for our neglect of praise to thee for all that thou hast done for us. Forgive us for our neglect of not publishing it as broadly and widely and as enthusiastically as we should have. Now be with us today. We thank thee for America, and we thank thee that we live on these shores and we pray that you would have mercy upon this wicked nation and that you would have mercy upon it for the sake of the righteous souls that still live here. Lord, if you would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain 
for but 10 righteous souls. Save America for the sake of the righteous souls here. Our trust is in thee. Lord, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, every sin of every kind, of every sort that we have committed. Cleanse us, O Lord. Purge it from us. Sanctify us by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may our worship of thee today be acceptable in thy sight. And O Lord, we pray for your blessing. For without thy blessing, we shall not be blessed. Pour out thy spirit. Open thy word. Lift up our hearts. Open our ears. Save us from the distracting cares of this life. That we may rejoice and embrace our Savior and the glorious gospel of the everlasting God. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis 12, was that? Yep, verse 3. Way back in Genesis, the Lord made a promise. The Lord said something. Do you know why that should be important to us? Because he's a faithful God. When the Lord says something, he's not like us. He doesn't just talk to fill the air. He means what he says. Let's sing about that as we turn our red hymnals to hymn number 32. Hymn number 32, as we sing about the great faithfulness of our God. Red hymnals, hymn number 32. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my
Amen. You know, we're going to have a brother come in just a second to remind us of what martyrs have gone through in the past by bringing a specific martyr to us. Our young brother Colin will do that in just a moment. We need to think about that. We are living a time where we don't have the same pressures that they had. We live in a more dangerous time where all the comforts lull us to sleep. So we need to challenge ourselves. Are we on the Lord's side? Are we going to stand for the Lord in this day? Let's remind ourselves of that as we turn to 578 in our red hymnals. The Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to gain. His blood-red banner streams afar, who follows in his, fr- in his train. Hymn number 578 in our red hymnals. The Son of God goes forth to war. Consider this morning some martyrs from Bohemia around the time of the 15, the early 1500s, uh, modern day Czech Republic. <clears throat> I don't have any specific names for you, it's just a group of people that were um, persecuted um, beyond belief. And uh, I want to present a couple of them to you. Again, I don't have their names, but they were people that trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and were not even persecuted for specific doctrines that they held to, but rather they weren't Catholic and um, denied you know, things like the sacraments and all, but they weren't Catholic, and so they were killed for it. <clears throat> um, 1558, Ferdinand I, he was the Holy Roman Emperor. He ruled over Hungary, Croatia, Bohemia, and Austria until his death in 1564. His motto, he had a motto, it was, Let justice be done, though the world perish. Although he uh, was very unjust towards all that were not Catholic. <clears throat> he took control of the lands of Bohemia in 1525. Again, it's present-day Czech Republic. The Protestants in Bohemia had revolted against him, and he subsequently defeated them, as most revolters were in that day and age. And then he attempted to turn all of them to Catholicism. We understand submission to authority, and while many of these rebellious Protestants had questionable faith at best, there were still many that did believe in the, in the Son of God and were Christians and were persecuted for their religion. So this Ferdinand I instituted a high court of reformers, is what he called them. They were reformers. They were going to go into Bohemia and uh, either persuade or force the Protestants there to turn to Catholicism. These reformers were mostly Jesuits who were accompanied by a large company of soldiers. And uh, these Jesuits, these reformers, would point out Protestants. They would find the Protestants, point them out to the soldiers, and then the soldiers would kill them. These, uh, these soldiers were more violent than uh, maybe some others we've heard of. Uh, they, uh, they had no scruples. They found great enjoyment in their task, and each passing mur murder made them more and more brutal, more and more bold, and each experiment of torture caused them to try new tortures. These soldiers, aside from their lust for blood, were without any scru scruples concerning their treatment of women, often raping women in front of husbands and fathers. Again, there's little documentation of the names of those that suffered due to the sheer volume of uh, those that were killed, but their chief target was ministers. There was pa pastors. They wanted to eliminate those that taught the people against Catholicism. The following examples of cruel torture are not intended to satisfy anyone's twisted curiosity of how badly humans can suffer emotionally or physically, nor to put images in your mind's eye of grotesque indecency unnecessarily, but number one, cause us to be thankful for our freedom of religion. Yes. Amen. Yes. Number two, to remind us that sodomy is not the only sin that results from God rewiring a person. Can you imagine, what, what, what would it take for you to torture another human being? You'd have to be rewired. And God did that. The man of sin did indeed wear out the saints of the Most yes. High that we read about in, in Daniel 7.25. Yes. And they did it in every way possible. And uh, for, these murder, for these martyrs, I'm going to present to you briefly here. Uh, burning, being burnt at the stake, drowning, being hung, or beheaded, that would have been a mercy. So this is going to be a, a little more violent, and I just want you all to know, and I, I wanted to know, to what extent do people take their, uh, their rage against, against believers in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ, those that denied Catholicism, and, and here's what they did. So this band of soldiers is going throughout Bohemia and um, wearing out the saints of the Most High. Their first victim was an aged pastor whom they killed as he lay sick in bed. The next day they robbed and murdered another and soon after shot a third pastor as he was preaching in the pulpit. Some of the soldiers raped the daughters of a Protestant before his face and then tortured him to death in front of them. Another pastor and his wife they tied back to back and burnt. Another pastor, they hung upon a crossbeam, made a fire under him, and then broiled him to death. A man that, a young man, they took, filled his mouth with gunpowder, set it on fire, blew his head to pieces. Again, again, their, their principal rage was directed against pastors. So they found another Protestant pastor, and they proposed to torment him daily for one month. At the end of that month, they would kill him but they would torture him for a month and keep him alive. And here's what they did. They placed him in their midst, 
made him the subject of their derision and mockery during a whole day's entertainment, trying to exhaust his patience, but in vain, for he bore the whole with true Christian fortitude. They spit in his face, pulled his nose, and pinched him in most parts of his body. They set him loose in the woods, and proceeded to hunt him like a wild beast until he was about to die from fatigue. Again, this is going on for a month. They made him run the gauntlet between two ranks of them, each striking him with a twig. He was beat with their fists. He was beat with ropes. They scourged him with wires. He was beat with cudgels. Then they tied him up by the heels with his head downward until the blood started running out of his nose and mouth. Then they hung him by his right arm until it was dislocated, and then they had it set again. They did the same to the left arm. They took burning papers, dipped in oil, placed them between his fingers and his toes. His flesh was torn with red-hot pincers. And then, on top of all that, he was put to the rack. It's pretty bad. It's pretty grotesque. It's pretty cruel. This, this saint is being worn out. But they didn't stop there. They continued. Remember, this is only halfway through the month. They proceeded then to pull off the, toe, the, the nails of his right hand, pull off all his fingernails. And then they pulled off all the fingernails of his left hand. They took a knife and cut open his right ear, and then his left ear, and then slit open his nose. They whipped him through the town upon an ass. They made several incisions in his flesh. They pulled off the toenails of his right foot. Then they did the same with his left foot. Then he was tied up by the loins and suspended for a considerable time. The teeth of his upper jaw were pulled out. And then they pulled out the teeth of his lower jaw. All because he wasn't Catholic and he claimed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Boiling lead was poured upon his fingers, and then it was poured on his toes. Lastly, they took a knotted cord and twisted around his forehead so hard that his eyeballs popped out. During the whole of these horrid cruelties, this one-month period of time, particular care was taken that he would not, his wounds would not become so uh, infected or that his injuries would not be so mortal that he would die until the last day, the last day of this month, when his eyeballs popping out proved to be his death. They did a lot more than that. That's just a couple of examples. So why are you here this morning listening to me read this to you? Why are, you, why are we here? Why are we doing this? What is the point? Why would we even want to consider this? Number one, we want to thank God for our religious freedom. Yes, man. Yes, Lord. We should thank him for those that went before us. Yes. That bore physical, mental, emotional, and psychological suffering and pain with great fortitude. That's right. Few men could do this without the presence of God, without right. his Holy Spirit. These men did it. These men and women did it for Christ and are now under his altar. Amen. That's right. So what should, what should the result be? The result should be praise, thanksgiving, changed lives, the mortification of sin, yes. Yes. sobriety about our, our religion, and committed lives that all redound to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Both amazing what the depravity of man will do, but also amazing what the grace of God can sustain us through and keep us in. Because I'm sure at any point in time, had he recanted, he would have been spared or at least put out of his misery at that point. But for a solid month, he retained his faith in the midst of awful suffering. If you would, let's turn to hymn number 509. In our red hymnals. 
Him that had our, that brother known it would have given him comfort, and obviously he knew the Jesus we're going to be singing about. Please join me in standing. And Brother Eric DeVrent, if you'd like to come and lead us in prayer after this, before our brother opens up God's word for us this month, morning. 509 in our red hymnals. Jesus loved the unite our hearts together as one man in prayer. Oh, great Father, you art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Yes. 
You are holy and you are just. Amen. We just sang we are opposite of everything that you are. And it is sadly true. Lord, we are a sinful people. Thank you for the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Thank you for your son, holy, your holy child. We praise you through him. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Yes. We thank you, Father, that we have the truth. Thank you, you've preserved it. We thank you that great was a company that published it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for preserving it for us through faithful men. Lord, what a hardship some have suffered to do that. Yes. We do not suffer like we just heard about. Oh, Lord, we are a pitiful people for the little complaints I have and we have. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you that you have gone to all nations. Amen. We laud you yes. with all your saints. We pray for our pastor, our brother that you've raised up as he's going to bring us more of the truth of the gospel going forth to the Gentiles, the light thank amidst you, darkness. Yes. We thank you. Yes. Lord, bless him. Give him a boldness, a confidence. Give him clarity of mind and speech. May our hearts be eager to hear your word. Amen. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we commit this time to your care through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, brothers that went before me. Some of you may wonder about sharing the gory details of a martyr. If you read your Bible, you wouldn't. So I say that to your shame if that bothers you, what you just heard. Because the Bible is filled with that information from the beginning to the end of it. We can only get to the fourth chapter of Genesis when we read about a brother killing his brother for the sake of his pure religion. Four of the Gospels tell us about a crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why repeat it? Why did one Gospel tell us? Because it's worth reading over and over again of what Jesus Christ did for us. Amen. You only get a few chapters in the book of Acts and you have Saul of Tarsus keeping coats. As they stoned Stephen to death. For his pure religion. You get to Hebrews chapter 11 and it mentions torture. And it mentions being sawn asunder in the Bible. Those martyrs are under the altar of God, according to Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. They're his darlings. They're our darlings because they're his darlings. And we remember them, and we want to honor them. And like Colin explained, we want to convict ourselves about what we're willing to do for the cause of Jesus Christ. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning and to consider Paul's fourth preaching trip. I hope that you are thankful to the God of heaven for sending his grace to you to save you in the first place and his gospel to save you from error in the second place. Amen. If not the Ganges bathing, it would be Mecca kissing a meteorite it would be a Buddhist shrine and incense and a cardboard Lexus for our relatives in somewhere, or it'd be Rome worshiping some statue of Mary, praying ten Hail Marys to every Our Father if it weren't for the grace of God. Thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Paul's fourth preaching trip. 
let me remind you, you could never know God's Son, Jesus Christ, or all the blessings in Him, unless God sent a preacher to you. You could not know. You can't look at the glory of the Son and learn about Jesus. You can't look at the intricate construction of a rose and learn about Jesus. You can't look at your little baby's eyelashes and learn about Jesus. You need to have it revealed to you by preachers. The Bible tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe of whom, in whom of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. What peace matters? Peace in families, peace in nations? No. Peace with God. God is at peace with us sinful rebels and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel is glad tidings of good things. Like the doctrine of imputation. Imputation. Don't let that word confuse you. Imputation equals account. Equals count. Equals reckon. Four different verbs used in the Bible saying that God assigned Jesus Christ's righteousness to us and our sins to Jesus Christ. And that's imputation. That's glad tidings of good things that God's done for us. We Gentiles were entirely cut out of God's blessings until he grafted us in and gave us his son's kingdom. Entirely grafted out. We worshipped anything and everything. Incredible ignorance and rebellion and dysfunction in the earth until the Lord Jesus Christ saved us. So in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11, we are warned and we had this explained to us. Wherefore, remember. We want to remember that we're Gentiles. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time, before the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to send preachers to Gentiles, that at that time ye were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's what the Bible says about us Gentiles. But now, Paul could write in Ephesians chapter 2, in about 60 A.D., Paul could write, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, that's the past times, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. We're right alongside the Jews and being the people of God, and that is only the saved Jews, because he destroyed the rest of them. No preacher worked harder to keep himself and to keep the doctrine for his hearers to be saved than Paul. Paul told Timothy, Take heed unto thyself. Keep your personal life, Timothy, and take heed to the doctrine. Continue in those two things. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That's what Paul told Timothy to do, and Paul did that. Paul said, I therefore so run as an Olympic athlete to win first place, so fight I, I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Any means. He kept himself in control so that the gospel was taken to the Gentiles year after year. He suffered abuse. He had to put forth enormous effort to get the gospel to the Gentiles and thus to us.
Here's the earth. And there's a picture of our globe. And as I've shown you before, there's Brazil of the South American continent. And there's Africa. And there's the Arabian Peninsula and the Sinai Peninsula. And Jerusalem is about there. And there is the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where the Apostle Paul bestowed his labors, is on that Mediterranean Sea area of the earth. Here we are approaching the eastern end of that Mediterranean Sea. This is the Sinai Peninsula. The Arabian Peninsula. Here's the Sinai Peninsula. And there's Jerusalem, or so. And here's Cyprus. And here's Crete. And here's the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus from Asia into Europe. And here's Italy's boot. And this is the Mediterranean Sea. We get closer to it, and I've done this over and over with you because learning is by repetition. Right. I want you to know these places. Here is Egypt. Here is Israel. Paul's home church was way up here, Antioch of Syria. There's the Dardanelles, that famous place, and here's the Bosphorus, that channel from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. And here's the boot of Italy and Sicily that we're going to learn about today. Here we have a wider view of the whole Mediterranean Sea. Here's the Strait of Gibraltar that leads the Mediterranean Sea into the Atlantic Ocean. You already recognize the places. There is Italy. But I want you to know that right here, this is Spain. And here is France. And here is what? Britannia. Britain. Before we're done today, we'll have the gospel in Britain. Paul's home church, way over here in Antioch of Syria. God had mercy on that ball. That ball of rebels. God had mercy on us. He could have let us be born, live in ignorance, and die and spend eternity in hell. He sent his grace to save us, he sent his grace to adopt us, and he sent his gospel preachers to tell us about it all. Here is Paul's first missionary journey. And you probably can't see it in the back, so we'll just expand, we'll, we'll come in closer to it right here and see Paul leaving Antioch of Syria to go to Seleucia to catch a ship, to go to Cyprus, and that is trip number one, and that is Acts chapters 13 through 14. Trip number two. Paul starts off from his home church, Antioch in Syria. And it looks like this as we come in closer. And remember how important this section is right here? In this section right here, Paul couldn't go north because the Lord wouldn't let him. Paul couldn't go south because the Lord wouldn't let him. The Holy Spirit forced him to go west. And he came west and he came into Europe, and he came into Philippi because he had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And then he came down into Greece, Achaia. Macedonia is the northern half of Greece. Achaia is the southern half of Greece. He came to Athens. He met with philosophers there, converted some of them. He went to Corinth and spent 18 months there. He went over to Ephesus, and he went home stopped for a quick visit in Jerusalem, and back to his home church up here in Antioch of Syria. That was preaching trip number two. Preaching trip number three, again, starting from Antioch in Syria. He makes his way through Galatia and Phrygia over to Asia, and he comes to Ephesus. This third trip was primarily for Ephesus, and it's what we studied last Lord's Day. And this trip that he took through Greece and back again was very quick because he spent three years in Asia so that it could be said of him, he was free from the blood of all men in Asia. Right. 
That is how diligent he was for his three years there. And he comes back to Jerusalem. Now what happened? We don't have a red line making its way back up to his home church in Antioch of Syria because he was captured in Jerusalem. He was in the temple accommodating those Jewish apostles there that wanted him to take a Jewish oath on in order to show that he still had some sentimental reflection on Moses' law. It certainly wasn't necessary. It was a choice he made, and he was caught in the temple by some Jews who thought that he had defiled the place with Gentiles, and they slandered him. And that's Acts chapter 21 that we made our way to last Lord's Day. This is our map for today, and you are going to look at it for a while because we want to cover Paul's fourth trip. And so we come to Acts chapter 27. And you read it last evening, and you read Acts chapter 28 last evening. I hope you can see Jerusalem, where Paul had been captured, right down here. Jerusalem in the bottom lower right-hand corner. That's where he was captured by the Jews, but the Romans are going to deliver him. The reason that we are making this simple study of the Bible and Paul's preaching trips is for two reasons. Overall, it's for God sending the gospel to Gentiles. We want to understand it, and we want to appreciate it, and we want to respond properly to it. And there's two things, two Ps, that we want to remember. We want to praise God for saving us Gentiles. And we want to publish what he's done to as many people as we can in this world. We want the word of the Lord to sound out from us. We want to sound out through our families. We want to sound out through our colleagues. We want to sound out through anyone that God brings across our path. And we want to use the witty invention of the internet to send it into all 230 countries of the world, which we are doing right now while you sit there. There are people accessing our site and listening to sermons in every state of our union and in 230 countries of the world. We want the gospel to sound out from us. We we have tools to show them every slide we've ever produced, audio to hear, every sermon we've ever preached, written outlines for it, Proverbs commentaries, everything that we can put together, we want to publish. So there's two things we want to do. Praise and publish. Do you praise God for saving you as a Gentile? And do you want to help us publish it? Because if you don't, you're nothing like Paul. You are a selfish rebel against the good news of the gospel. Because anyone in the Bible that understood what they had heard and what had been done for them, wanted to share it with others. Andrew wanted to go find Peter in John 1. Philip had to go find Nathaniel in John 1. Philip had no problem going to preach in the middle of the desert to the eunuch. Peter went to preach to Cornelius. And so the spread of the gospel took place. And I hope that you can see this map even for those of you that sit in the back. I've made it as big as I can and as bright as I can, and I haven't segmented it because I want you to see the whole trip from Caesarea to Rome. Those are our reasons. It's a simple reason, two reasons, to praise and to publish. Now, open your Bibles to Acts 27 if you're not there already, but let's flip back to Acts 22 before we get started. And let's make a quick survey from where we left Paul last Lord's Day to Acts 27 and verse 1. We left Paul last Lord's Day in verse 30 of Acts 21. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. They grabbed Paul in the temple took him out of the temple and locked up the temple and began to beat him in the streets. When the chief captain heard 
the Roman garrison that was stationed there heard that Jerusalem was in an uproar, he brought his soldiers down and rescued Paul from the mob. And that ends chapter 21. In chapter 22, Paul preaches a fantastic sermon. Paul preaches a great sermon. The Jews would have been shouting amen for 20 verses until he gets to this one word. Acts chapter 22 and verse 21. And he said unto me, Paul is still preaching, and he's describing Jesus, meeting him on the road to Damascus. And Jesus said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Verse 22, And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Why did they want to kill the Apostle Paul in verse 22 and 3? Because he had said one word. What was that word? What you are. What every single one of us in this room are, we're Gentiles. They loved his sermon because it was about the history of Israel and God's merciful blessings on that people until he got to that one word, what you are. But thank the Lord that the Jewish leadership And all the seminarians and all the THDs and all the doctors of the scriptures and the scribes did not rule the day. The day was ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ who sent the gospel to us. If we go a few verses further, the chief captain, sensing that something was wrong and there's really only one way to get someone to tell the truth, let's beat it out of them. And so as they bound Paul with thongs, in verse 25, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? And so we have this great lesson right here of Paul's practical wisdom. There is no virtue in suffering for the gospel when you can avoid it. You have heard me recently mention Tortured for Christ, the story of Richard Wormbrandt in Romania. Richard Wormbrandt was not as wise and as practically careful as Paul was. Paul was let down by a basket to get out of the city of Damascus because a basket was better than a stoning. And here the Apostle Paul appealed to the laws in place to be saved from a beating. There's wisdom in it. That's chapter 22. We come to chapter 23. And Paul is smacked around on the face while he's on trial. And he rebukes the high priest rather strongly. It's explained to him that it's the high priest. And he apologizes for it and quotes the scripture. And then in verse 6, that was in verse 5, where the apostle Paul apologized and quoted scripture for saying what he said to the high priest. In verse 6, he perceived that his audience was half Sadducees and half Pharisees, and so he appealed to them that his dad was a Pharisee, and he was a Pharisee. Now, Paul hated Phariseeism as much as you and I do. Paul hated Phariseeism as much as Jesus did. But this is practical wisdom. His dad had been a Pharisee, and he had been a Pharisee, and so he says that. I was, I was born a Pharisee, My dad was one, and I was committed to their cause. And so he split the Jews. The Pharisees wanting to defend him, the Sadducees still hating him because he believed in the resurrection. And he made the point of his trial one simple point of doctrine. This is just wonderful wisdom. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the dead, which the Sadducees denied, but the Pharisees affirmed. Now, verse 12 in chapter 23 introduces us to 40 very hungry and thirsty men. 40 men said that we will not drink or eat until we have killed Paul. Well, Paul's nephew heard that story. And so Paul's nephew went to the chief captain and explained this vow. And those men have not had a drink yet, nor had a bite to eat. Because Paul was rescued by the Romans in verse 23 of Acts 23, sending him to Caesarea 
with 570 Roman soldiers to protect him. Here's the here's our God protecting our beloved brother Paul. And I want you to notice that this pagan, Jehovah-hating, Greek pantheon-worshipping empire were ministers of good over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. To the Apostle Paul and to others. Yes, they put Christians to death at times, but there were other times where the, the Roman Empire saved our brethren in the past. So we come to Acts chapter 24. And Paul is in Caesarea, safe now. And you can see it on your map, the map that's in front of you. Caesarea is right here. It's at the seashore of the Mediterranean Sea. And Paul's in prison there. And Felix is in charge. And the Jews send an orator named Tertullus to Caesarea to condemn Paul. And in Acts chapter 24 and verse 10, you have the beginning of Paul out orating the orator. Paul's speech is brilliant. He was trained as well as Tertullus was, but he had God the Holy Spirit as his tutor. Right. And his speech is magnificent. That's in Acts 24. In verse 23, the Romans knew that he hadn't committed a crime worthy of death, so they gave him liberty to have people come to see him and to keep up his ministry. In verse 25, Felix had the chance of a lifetime by Paul having personal devotions with him, but he procrastinated and did nothing with the word of God that was given to him. How many of you will procrastinate and not do with the word of God what you hear today? To praise and to publish his great name for what he's done for us. Acts chapter 25, Festus is now in charge of this part of the world, and Paul appears before Festus, and the Jews come down from Jerusalem, to Caesarea and accuse him. And Festus asks, asks Paul, would you like to go to Jerusalem to have your trial there? And Paul knew the danger of being out on the road between Caesarea and Jerusalem, and he said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat by representation. I, this is where I stand. I have done nothing worthy of, of death. I appeal to Caesar. I do not want to go to Jerusalem. I want to go to Rome. And so that's Acts 25, and it occurs in verse 10. In Acts 26, Festus has Agrippa join him to hear Paul testify of his faith, because Agrippa was more knowledgeable of the Jews' religion than Festus was because of his wife, Bernice. But in verse 28, after Paul makes a magnificent speech about Jesus Christ appearing to him on the road to Damascus, and what his ministry was and why, and about the resurrection of the dead, he appeals to Agrippa. Agrippa, surely you believe the prophets. And Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What a terrible word. Almost. Almost is dead last. Almost is worthless. Almost is worse than being cold. Almost is lukewarm nothingness. Right. Never let us be almost for Jesus Christ. As Paul would say in the next verse, let us be altogether like him. There's your two A words. Agrippa said almost. Paul said altogether. Such an one is me. And then in verse 32 of Acts 26, Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Once you appeal to Caesar, you had to go to Caesar. Because Agrippa and Festus realized the man's done nothing worthy of death, we could release him. But God's purpose is being worked out, and that gets us to Acts chapter 27 and verse 1, so that we can take a little excursion trip 
on a boat. For those of you that like cruises, this is a cruise from Caesarea to Rome. And sometimes it looks like a cruise ship, more than a prisoner ship, and at other times it's a disastrous trip. And there's two brothers in here that know about being shipwrecked with me many, many years ago, around 40 years ago. But it, we didn't see a storm for 14 days and 14 nights, brothers. We only saw it for a few hours. But 14 days and 14 nights, Luke and Paul and Aristarchus are on a ship to Rome, and they do not see the sun or the stars for two weeks. And Luke wrote, all hope was gone. But hope is never gone with our God. And you need to believe that and embrace it. And so we come to Acts chapter 27 and the first six verses. Acts 27, it has five parts. I'll read them and briefly explain them. And we'll follow along with our map. But we are at Caesarea and he is put on a ship. Acts 27 verse 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia. One Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. See, Paul's using the first person pronoun. He's saying us. Because Luke is on the ship. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke is on the ship with Paul. So he is saying us and we. Because he's with our beloved brother Paul. Verse 3. And the next day we touched at Sidon. And Julius courteously entreated Paul. And gave him liberty to go unto his friends. To refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence. We sailed under Cyprus. Because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So here's Sidon. They take a day to get up to Sidon. Paul's put on a ship. He's got a centurion keeping him. He's probably got his sentry on that ship as well with a whole bunch of prisoners making their way to Rome. You know, when it says the Augustus band, Augustus band with an apostrophe, a band is a tenth of a legion. A legion was 6,000 soldiers. A band was 600 so how many centurions would there be in a band? Six. Because a century is a hundred, and a centurion is in charge of a hundred soldiers, but a band was six hundred. So this Augustus band of a cohort, band equals cohort of the Roman army, one-tenth of a legion, was Augustus' band. And so he's got Julius with him. Notice when he gets to Sidon, this is why I call it like a cruise. It starts out like a cruise ship. Because the centurion comes to Paul and entreats him to get off board and go into town and check out his friends. Entreating is to kindly beg. When we find the word entreat in the Bible, that's a very strong term for begging someone to do something. And here's the centurion. The, where were the other prisoners? They were not in town at the QT. They were in that ship, chained down, and very secure. But Paul's given liberty like he had liberty at Caesarea. And that's just pleasant to notice. Now, it said the wind wasn't very good. You're wondering, why is this in the Bible? Why is Acts 27 and 28 in the Bible? Is it because Luke still had nightmares about that sailing trip? Maybe. But God inspired it. Because we're going to get behind schedule by these bad winds. And we're going to get behind schedule so that Paul can make a prophecy that comes to pass. And the ship owner is going to go against Paul. And the centurion is going to come to love Paul. Because Paul's going to be right every time. 
and Paul's going to save all their lives in a terrific shipwreck at sea. Every single one of them. Did any sailors escape? No. Was every soldier saved? Yes. There's sailors, there's prisoners, there's soldiers, and there's Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus. And there's a centurion in charge of those soldiers. And so they have to go up and around the island of Cyprus instead of cutting across the Mediterranean Sea toward Asia. They have to go around it because the wind was contrary to them, and that's the problem with a sailboat. The wind has to be your helper. And if the wind isn't your helper and you don't have a motor, you're in trouble. What else can we see in this first little section? Let's go on to section 2, verse 7 through 13. And when we had sailed slowly many days, we're in the second ship now. Let's back up just a little bit into verses 5 and 6, because when they came to Myra in Lycia, they, ch they changed ships to get into a ship from Alexandria, Egypt, right down here. They had been in a ship of Adramidium, which is way up here, above per Pergamum. So they traded ships. They're in a grain ship. The ship is full of wheat. We're going to find out about that later. So it's a grain ship, and there's a uh, hundred soldiers now aboard with a centurion and three noted prisoners and, and other prisoners. And we read verse 7, And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Natus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete, over against Salmoni, and hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phenice, and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing fence, they sailed close by Crete. Oh, a lot of interesting things in this little section. They're on a new ship from Myra. Let's get back up here to Myra. In Lycia, part of Asia. So they've made their way around Cyprus and they trade into another ship. But there's no wind. And so it tells them for many days, they just crept along getting over here to Nidus. Many days to get to Nidus. Wait till uh, there's wind in their sails. They will go from Regium to Petioli in one day. If you're looking at the map, their last day of sailing was one tremendous tailwind pushing them forward. And so they made great progress. But Luke writes many days to get from Myra over to Nidus because the wind was contrary to them. So each time that the wind is contrary to them, they're getting farther and farther behind on safe sailing in the Mediterranean Sea so that all of it's working out together for the glory of God. All things work together for good right. to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Turning south from Nidus, they went down to Crete and passed the promontory there. It's a high jutting piece of land that sticks out from Crete that's visible in the Pacific, I mean, it's visible in the Mediterranean Sea. Came down into the island of Crete to Fair Havens and Lycia. And that's where Paul warned them. Paul's warning right here. Paul warned about the dangers of the voyage, but they ignored him. The centurion wanted to make his appointment. He didn't want to be late. The ship owner knows what all business owners know. Time is money. Time is money. So he wanted to make it to Rome if he could. 
with his load of grain. And so they disagreed with Paul. But Paul gave them a fair warning that there's going to be a lot of trouble. We're going to get into a storm. There's going to be a loss of the ship. And our lives are going to be threatened. But they went ahead and went their own way. And this is what men love to do. And I love to watch it happen. They decided to go against the Apostle Paul from Fair Havens. They wanted to make it over to Phoenix. Now that's only, look at the scale. We're only talking 50 miles. All they had to go was 50 miles. Paul said, stay right here in Fair Havens. I know it's not the best place. Shore leave is not going to be very exciting. But let's stay here because there's danger out there if you take off from this port. But they said, we're only wanting to go 50 miles and... Phoenice is so much better, called Phoenix or Phoenice. It's so much better. And so they take off. And look at the line for 20 miles. The line for 20 miles looks really nice. Verse 13 tells us, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing fence, they sailed close by Crete, Oh, they're doing everything to show Paul wrong. They're like Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Ahab said, let me disguise myself and go into battle so that I can prove Paul wrong. So they're sailing close to Crete, and there's a nice breeze blowing. Nothing like a storm. How many times have we seen in our lives that someone is told something they ought to do to please God more perfectly, and they rebel against it, and things go okay with them temporarily. God does that to deceive them and to punish them by thinking they've made a good choice. In the Bible, it is called the prosperity of fools. Proverbs 1.32. It's why one person out of 10 billion wins a lottery. It's the prosperity of fools. It's to get the last dollar out of the other poor people. Rich people don't buy lottery tickets. They would never be that stupid. It's the prosperity of fools because they can look at the television and see someone holding a big check and it doesn't come to their little minds that what isn't being shown on television is a hundred million poor people that bought those tickets to their disadvantage and didn't get anything. And so the, Paul gave them the truth from God. And the centurion and the ship owner decided to go anyway. And so they're going to be conservative and they're going to sail close to Crete. And the weather is just beautiful. And you know what they're thinking to themselves if they didn't say out loud. See, everything's fine. But about 20 miles from the fair havens, it was no longer fair. Look at that line. Are you able to see that? They sail along Crete. They get about halfway or 40% of the way to Phoenix. And all of a sudden, they run into trouble. The words are, but not long after. But not long after. Brethren, don't ever forget those words. But not long after. If you want to choose to go against God's word... Not long after you make that choice, you're in trouble. You may get away with it for a little while. And the Lord tells us that in Psalm 50. The Lord tells us in Psalm 50, I was quiet. I was silent. I didn't punish you. I allowed you to have friends with adulterers. I allowed you to have thieves as friends. I didn't say anything. But now I'm going to tear you in pieces and none will be able to deliver you. It's the last five verses of Psalm 50. But not long after. And we want that not long after to terrify us into righteousness. That there's a God in heaven and he wants us to do what's right. Paul gave them great advice that would have preserved the cargo, preserved the ship, and preserved them from 14 days without seeing the sun or moon. It would have been win, win, win if they'd have just listened to Paul. 
but they wanted to do it their way. And if it hadn't been for the grace of God, it would have been lose, lose, lose. It was lose, lose, okay. Meaning swimming to shore and being taken care of around a bonfire by barbarians. And so that's the second section that gets us from verse 7 to verse 13. Now let's read verses 14 to 20. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Erocladon. And when the ship was caught in that wind and could not bear up into the wind, the tacking method of most sailing, we let her drive. We just let her go. There wasn't a thing we could do. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, and it is there in the Mediterranean. It's just not on this map. It's very small. We had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands off of North Africa, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. I've had a little tiny microcosmic experience like this of hope being taken away and, and suffering through a little bit of a shipwreck um, 40 years ago. But no, nonetheless, they didn't want to listen to Paul, so they headed for Phoenice, and they only made it 40% of the way, and a terrible storm came up and drove them south. They could not tack the ship, so they just let her run wherever. But they were afraid of those sand shoals off the coast of North Africa. And so they, they strake sail. They were girding up the ship. They were afraid of running aground. You know, they were strapping the thing in by more ropes running around. It's a wooden ship to keep it strapped together. They didn't have cables and come-alongs quite like we do, but they were trying to hold that thing together. It was a pretty big ship to have a big cargo of grain and 276 passengers aboard. That was a big sailing vessel. And so they get into that trouble, and we're told about that in the verses that I just read to you, verses 14 through 20. Terribly tossed in the storm. They're throwing out their own tackling. Some of the own equipment, they wanted to get that thing lightened. Remember, what are you going to throw out last? Your cargo. You're going to hope to make it with your cargo, because money's the most important thing. But they'll end up getting rid of that soon as well. And so there they are in the middle of the Mediterranean. Just for your, inter for your interest, between Crete and Malta, where they're in that storm, because here we are in this area right in here. Ships caught, ships caught in a storm for 14 days. The Mediterranean is three miles deep. You know, I showed you on Wednesday evening how the Mariana Trench in uh, the Pacific is seven miles deep. But this is just a lake compared to the Pacific. The Mediterranean isn't a very big sea, but it's still three miles deep in the middle there, so you're not going to touch bottom even if you hold your nose. It's interesting that when we get toward the island of Malta, that the captain is going to say that those of you that can swim, this, if you, you ought to read every word in your Bible. Those of you that can swim should jump in and swim. The rest of you should get on some piece of the ship and make your way to shore. What in the world are you doing out in a storm like Eurocladon and not being able to swim? Do you know what you were thinking 25 hours a day? It's deep, and it's a long way to shore, and I don't know how to swim. That's just bad news all the way around. But this is Acts 27, and this is God taking care of Paul. This is God getting the gospel to us. Before we're done, Paul's going to be in Rome, and the gospel's going to go forth. And before we're done today, I'm going to give you some things to think about that go way beyond Rome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we got to get to Rome first. And the Lord is taking care of his greatest preacher. And that's the Apostle Paul. 
And Paul said he was an apostle to the Gentiles. He's our apostle, and he magnified his office, and God protected him, and God blessed him. And so we made our way down from verse down to verse 20. And so now we're going to read from verse 21 through 38. I love verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, it didn't come and go. It just hung over them. Who could send a storm and have it just hang over a ship that's being tossed in the waves but the God of heaven? All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Beginning at verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. I told you so is how you translate that. (laughs) Verse 22. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. This is Paul. This is why he's going to be loved all the way through this trip. Because of his power with God and his cheerful spirit. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. How can you be of good cheer after a storm like that? But the storm is still going. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Can we say that about ourselves? whose I am and whom I serve, I'm the Son of God and I serve Him, then God will take care of you one way or another. You will never suffer loss of any meaningful kind because God will give you grace to bear up through that loss if you are His and you serve Him. Saying, this God that I serve sent an angel that stood by me and taught me this, told me this, fear not, Paul, Verse 24, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. That means they pinged. Right? No. They dropped an anchor with a measured rope. They sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. They're getting close to land. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, the sailors wanted to commit mutiny and desert. When they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off, their lifeboat. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, And they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship two hundred, three score, and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. Let's lighten this thing up as much as we can if we're going to have a shipwreck on this island that Paul's told us about that we can tell by sounding we're getting closer and closer to. Paul had fasted long to the Lord. It told us in verse 21 and so forth. And so the Lord appeared to him. And the Lord gave him a comforting word. And so here's Paul walking with God. And God walking with Paul. Whether it's sea. 
whether on the land, whether in the perils of robbers, whether in perils of the sea, whether in perils of his own countrymen, whether in perils of strangers, the Lord's always with Paul because Paul could say, whose I am and whom I serve. Right. Let's make sure we can always say that. I am his and he is mine and I will serve him and do anything for him. The Lord will be with us. The Lord will be with us. That doesn't mean there's not going to be any loss in life, but the Lord will give you grace to bear it. We just heard about a man this morning, that martyr that was tortured for 30 days. That's some terrible loss, but how was he able to endure it? By the grace of God that was with him. How what kind of a reward would he get when he gets to heaven and meets the Lord Jesus Christ? Better than anything you could ever get by having all your little marshmallows down here. So try to keep everything in perspective when you think about serving the Lord. I love Paul. He breaks it out and has a toast. Cheers to good health. Are both words in here? Cheer and health. Cheers for good health. And so the Apostle Paul ate and then they ate. Now let me share something with you. We're over here in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And we're getting very close to Malta. We're over here now. But notice what it said in verse 8. I want the word Adria. Twenty-seven, But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria. What do you think Adria stands for? It refers to a sea. Do you think it refers to the Mediterranean, the Aegean, the Tyrrhenian, the Ionian, the Adriatic Sea? And so here's a little issue in Bible interpretation. You understand the Adriatic Sea by your maps and the way it's labeled on this map that the Adriatic Sea is up there between Macedonia and the boot of Italy. Do you see Adriatic up there? Yep. And so once you make a decision that I want to go with current understanding of Adria, I want to go with the current limitations of the Adriatic Sea, you limit Paul to have been blown way north up there by Croatia. And sure enough, there is an island off the coast of Dalmatia and Croatia there's many islands, but there's one up there named Majlet. Majlet, M-J-L-E-T, very close to Melita. And so the people of that region think that that is where Paul was shipwrecked because of the word Adria. I like their method, but it's not nearly good enough. Because when you go back and look at maritime maps of the Mediterranean, the Adri, the Adria Sea ran all the way down to North Africa. That whole section in there is called Adria. And so it, the, the way that that ship was driven and the things that are described and how they got to Syracuse in just a couple of days, they couldn't have been in the Adriatic Sea. And I want to tell you about your brother in Croatia. Your brother in Croatia knows all about this dilemma and he's right on the side of Malta. He knows that it's Malta and though there would be sentimental value in thinking that Paul had been shipwrecked just a, a little bit offshore of where he lives there in Croatia, he knows better. And so if you do a whole lot of comparison, and it's not all that difficult, you realize that Adria was once much larger than it is on this map or on current maps. On current maps, the Adriatic Sea is limited to the area between Macedonia, Croatia, and Italy but it extended way down toward North Africa in the past, and that's what's being referred to here, and they did end up on Malta because we can tell that by how quickly they got to Sicily as we go ahead and read. But I just wanted to share that with you. Do you know why that's important? Do you know why I bring it up right now? Because I brought it up on Wednesday evening. When you are reading about unicorn, behemoth, or leviathan, don't limit yourself to creatures you know. You only know a fraction of the creatures God has made. I don't care what zoo you've been to, and I don't care if you have Wi-Fi at your house. You only know some of God's creatures. Did you know that they just found another killer whale in the last 72 hours? 
that they'd never known about before. Don't limit things to your understanding of them. We need to go back and, and understand in context and the time when Scripture was written. And so Adria, in verse 27 of Acts chapter 27, extended way down to that area between Crete and Malta where Paul is being driven. The sailors try to escape by using the lifeboat under guise of casting out more anchors. But Paul gets the centurion, and the centurion's listening to Paul now. The centurion was kind to Paul previously, but now he's listening to Paul because 14 days and 14 nights of punishment have let him know that Paul really knew what was going on. Paul wants every single passenger saved for the benefit of the centurion. The centurion isn't smart enough to be thinking through everything, and neither would you. Listen, it only took four hours for us not to be thinking straight in our little shipwreck that we had. Can you imagine 14 days? But Paul wants to save every passenger for the centurion's reputation, which will be his reputation. Because when he gets to Rome, the centurion's going to do everything kind that he can for Paul, because Paul did everything kind that he could for the centurion while they were out to sea. Do you understand that? And so Paul tells the centurion, listen, God's told me that everyone's going to be saved. If you try to violate the prophecy by letting these sailors escape, you're going to cost yourself dearly. And so the, the centurion tells his soldiers to cut the ropes, the lifeboat falls away, and they go on. Wonderful story. Paul exhorts them all to eat, and so they have a, they have a snack out there. They have themselves a snack out to sea in the middle of this storm. And there's an expression made that not a hair from any head should perish. That's hyperbole. We still use it today. And we don't actually mean that you could have count your, counted your hairs before the event and then counted them after the event and it'd be the same number. But it's a statement that no harm's going to come to this crew. That's right. And so we have that in the, this passage. And so we go to the next section, which is verses 39 through 44. Verse 39. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. Now there is, on the eastern side of Malta, it's now called St. Paul's Bay. It is a bay that is two miles deep and a mile wide, and it's called St. Paul's Bay to this day. And when they had taken up the anchors, in verse 40, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoised up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. And the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they sh which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Amen. Praise be to God Amen. for 276 making it safe to shore in this particular shipwreck. Now there was going to be a, another reduction in the 276. The soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners. What would have happened to the soldiers for doing that? They would have lost their lives. You didn't lose prisoners in the Roman Empire. But they were, out of the, they were beyond their wits. They did not know what to do. What are we going to do? These men are going to escape. And so the centurion because he understood that Paul was a prisoner, though a notable one, and though a different kind of one, if the soldiers killed all the prisoners, they'd kill Paul. And so the centurion said, no, do not kill the prisoners. If he can swim, get to shore, so that he could save Paul. And it all worked out for good, so that that centurion did not lose a soldier, did not lose a prisoner, and did not lose a sailor. Right. Tremendous accomplishment. And that will bring us to our break. And it will bring us to Acts chapter 28. 
and they're on the island of Malta, called at that time in the Bible, Melita. And they make it to shore, all 276 of them. You say, what's that in the Bible for? What do we have to read about tackling being thrown out? What do we have to read about 14 days with no sun or stars or moon? This is how God protected Paul so that you could hear the gospel. So far, he's only made it to Turkey and Greece. Don't you want him to get a little farther west? Just a little bit? May the Lord bless the preaching of his word.